on today's story beat. The advantage of an editor, of course, is their audience more than the director would be, who's much too involved. And there, and you know, there are always problems on location and on set that the editor doesn't have to think about. They can just watch it objectively and internalize everything, not only performance, but uh, intent, um, finding nuggets that maybe were never intended. This is Story Beat with Steve Cuton, a podcast for the creative mind. Story Beat explores how masters of creativity develop and produce brilliant works that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuton. Thanks for joining us on Story Beat. We're coming to you from the Steel City, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My guest today, Bobby Osteen, is a writer and film historian dedicated to sharing the invisible art of editing with students, professionals, and cinephiles. Bobby's a graduate of Stanford University, an Emmy-nominated editor, and author of two acclaimed books about editing, Cut to the Chase, based on interviews with her late husband and colleague, the legendary editor, Sam Osteen, about such landmark films that he edited like The Graduate and Chinatown, and The Invisible Cut, which deconstructs the editing process in classic movie scenes through a cut-by-cut analysis. Her latest book, called Making the Cut at Pixar, to be published this year by Focal Press, is an authoritative media-rich ebook about the editor's pioneering role in computer animation. Bobby hosts an ongoing event series called Inside the Cutting Room, honoring editors through screenings and discussions at the American Cinema Editors Edit Fest for the Manhattan Edit Workshops Sight, Sound, and Story at Emerson College, the 92nd Street Y, and UCLA. Bobby has also taught at the American Film Institute, John Hopkins University, the New School, and NYU's Tisch School of the Arts. She's also created an ongoing class series, Making the Cut, where she explores the artistry and technique of editing based on her interviews with over 70 editors. She's contributed commentary and discussion for the Criterion Collection in releases of iconic films such as A Hard Day's Night and Don't Look Now. And Bobby has also written articles for many publications, including Cinema Editor Magazine, which named her Film Editing's Greatest Champion. For more, please visit bobbyosteen.com. So for all those reasons and many more, it's a great privilege for me to have the incredibly gifted editor, writer, and teacher Bobby Osteen as my guest on StoryBeat today. Bobby, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, the pleasure is all mine, believe me. All right, so let's go back in time. When did you first become interested in filmmaking? When did you, did, did this happen when you were a little girl? Is it the influence of your family? How did it happen? My father was an editor, a mm -hmm. wonderful editor. Um, he edited Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, among mm -hmm. other films. Which is, which is <laughs> right up there in my top three, four, five movies of all time. But to be honest, um, I was a fan of movies as a child, but not particularly invested in the idea of getting involved in film professionally. I was, um, I majored in anthropology at Stanford <laughs> and I really probably would have ended up being a professor, I think. Um, mm -hmm. But my father decided that told me that he it would be a good idea if just for security purposes i got into the editor's union hmm. so that's really how i started in the editing world um almost like I, the family business like it was being passed down <laughs> yeah and i uh, what was interesting about my introduction to it is to be honest i ultimately felt that Conceptually, I was completely fascinated by the editing process, and I felt it was something that I had insights about, but I don't feel that I was particularly spatially or mechanically oriented. And so what is I that for the listeners that don't mean? What do you mean by spatially and mechanically yeah. oriented, and how does that relate to editing? Well, it's funny because it's not really spoken about very much or at all, but 
the truth is that you real, you know, some people are more spatially oriented than others. Like you can look at parts in an IQ test, you look at parts of a box and you pre-visualize how they come together. Mm -hmm. And some, it's just, you know, that's engineers and people like that, architects there, they have a, a natural talent. It's an, an inherent given gift, you know, and um, in order to really be a successful editor, you have to pre-visualize how the sequence is going to come together. Not, not per perfectly, you're going to make changes, but you do have to look at the film and and know where you're going to go. You can't, you don't do it piecemeal. You have to have sort of an overall vision of how the scene is going to come into shape. Would you say that comes prior to production where it's even at script form, they have to be able to visualize it? No. Just after, I, fo after photography. Yeah, I mean, I think studying the script is very useful in terms of knowing what what's the values are in terms of character and plot and but I think that um, what's really significant is is once you get the dailies the film itself and you watch it very uh, studiously and um, and the advantage of an editor of course is their audience more than the director would be who's much too involved and there and you know, there are always problems on location and on set that the editor doesn't have to think about. They can just watch it objectively and internalize everything, not only performance, but uh, intent, um, finding nuggets that maybe were never intended, accidents on set, mm -hmm. or just, it could be a little moment before they say action. It could be, but just, um, really also planning what, where they're going to go in a scene, you know, what, what is the scene about and what is that moment I want to build to and how does the characters change within that scene within and all these things they have to be thinking about as they're watching it. They and also have the opportunity, correct me if I'm wrong, but they then have the opportunity to turn to the director and say, wait a minute, you're missing something here that really will make a difference. You need to shoot something, reshoot or shoot something that will make a difference in terms of the total scene. Yeah, I mean, it, it would be less about performance probably and more about um, an angle or some kind of coverage that they mm -hmm. need in order to either have all the information that's needed for the audience or maybe to avoid an awkward edit or something like that it would be more that kind of thing. I all right, think. so I, I wanna just step back a half a step. For, for those who don't really understand or know what editors do or who they are or why they're even there, what is the, what is the basic primary function of an editor and why is it important that we have editors on motion pictures? Well, the editor is the final writer. Mm -hmm. of the film. You know, the first the first stage is the actual screenplay. The second is the actual shooting, and the third is the editing. Mm -hmm. And that's there. Also, as I said, they have the objectivity that the director doesn't have, but they also um, they're shaping the film they're taking raw footage and shaping the film into a compelling story with compelling characters. And it's, it's really all boils down to the fact that the audience needs to care and needs to stay on that ride and, and be involved from the beginning to the end of the film. And that is, it could involve restructuring the entire movie. It could be rewriting in the cutting room. Or it could be saving a performance when the actor didn't quite make it, but you would never know because the the editor, you know, cut to certain moments that made it work. Mm -hmm. um, so, so they're really um, they're the, they are in in every sense of what you think of a writer that that's what they're doing. They're really making the film the, the best possible. Also, always being aware of what the vision of the director is. You know, right. the marriage of the editor and director is a very important relationship because they're really trying to 
no, it's not their vision. The, it's never the editor's vision. It's a director's vision. Right, and, they, right. and they're really trying to do the best they can to make that vision come across to the audience. And, and editors are putting together what Jimmy Stewart famously called little pieces of time. And those little pieces of time can be manipulated and arranged in a myriad ways. And that's what does it. Yeah. And there's, it's their magicians in a way, you know, there's a lot of sleight of hand. There's a lot of things you don't see. You're not, you really, unless it's some kind of stylistic fast action scene where you may be aware of the cuts. If a movie is really working, you should not notice the editing. Absolutely. Because if you're always where you want to be, I mean, this is what I noticed bad editing to me is I'm watching a scene and I'm dying to see this one character's face, this one actor's face. And the editor did not cut to that person's face when I wanted to see that moment. So the editor has to have their finger on the audience's pulse to know what they want before they even know they want it. Mm -hmm. And that's there, sort of the magician thing, you know? Well, of course, the footage has to be there in the first place, or otherwise the editor has nothing to cut to, right? Right. But, but what's interesting is I find time and again, that editors are often most proud of the films that were the most problematic mm -hmm. because they had to do the most work. If the footage is fantastic, it's an easier job. If you're sure. actually restructuring and with, with, I mean, if it's a terrible script, you can't ever make a, a good movie out of it. I mean, you, that's the one thing, you know? You can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear, as they say. Or as Roman Polanski said, it's like sprinkling cinnamon on shit. I hope that's okay to say. <laughs> that's quite okay to say. Um, so an, an editor can take poorly produced material and make it great. And an editor that doesn't know what they're doing can also take great material and make it yeah. un, unintelligible. Yeah, but usually, uh, uh, very often the editor gets blamed when they shouldn't also, you know. <laughs> um, I think, you know, you could have a bad preview and then they replace the editor and it really wasn't the editor's fault. I think one of the things that's unfortunate is a lot of people really don't understand what editing is because it is it is very mysterious. And, and one of the reasons why I find these events so, so rewarding is you that you really don't know what the editor accomplished unless you actually saw the footage they had to work with, how much control they had in the cutting room, because that depends too, whether it's a director or producer telling them what to do. And you just, but if, if you run foot sequences and scenes and the editor talks about, I will always say to an editor, we spend a lot of time choosing clips to show because mm -hmm. it's so important the show and tell part because I say don't just show a scene that the audience likes I want to know a scene that you struggled with or that you accomplished something there was some sort of evolution that you could that helps you explain your process and that's you know that's the most rewarding thing for an audience ideally we can show before and after and every well, once in a while we get to well that's that's really great because it's, it tends to not be helpful to people when you're teaching them to show them the thing that worked perfectly. It's almost always better to show the thing that didn't work. So here's what, how it set up and how it laid out and how, here's the finished product. And it, we made it better, but it still could have been better had we done X, Y, or Z. Yeah. Or even be, being able and, 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 you know, editors and teach often have this luxury is to show the dailies, to show the footage mm, mm -hmm. and then show what they did with it or what they originally, you know, ideally you have some it done not well and then they do it well, you know, but. Well, it's you know. always interesting to me when somebody takes here, here are 35 shots. Now you go put it together and then they realize, wait a minute, this is harder to do than it looks. It's, it's a, in a sense, the same going back to like screenwriting. People think they watch a television show or a movie and that looked easy. I can do that. But then they sit down to actually write a script and you find out, wait a minute, this is a lot harder than it looks in its finished form. You know, it's a great thing that I just started doing um, just recently. And I always get the same answers. I started asking these editors and these are very successful people. And I'll say, 
do you ever have doubt, self doubt? <laughs> and every one of them says, absolutely. <laughs> you know, usually when they start a new film, am I a fraud? You know, have I lost my touch? The only person who had no idea what I was talking about was Ann Coates, <laughs> Ann Coates. <laughs> who was 94 when I interviewed her. But they always say, you know, it's just because, it, you know, whenever you're in a creative field, I feel that there's that. And, and editing is so, it's so, you know, it's so overwhelming at the beginning. Like, how do I start? How do I jump in? Where do I start? You know, it's, it's, it's very, it's a very challenging process. Well, and not only that, but the, the footage is originally coming to the editor out of sequence. Yeah, they're, they're not shooting it from the first scene to the last scene. They're shooting it all all over the place. So figuring out what those rhythms and the timing and all the rest of it is can be very challenging until you have much more. And then sometimes you have a scene that's not working or you think it's not working. But then when you get the context and you get more scenes coming together, you sure. realize it's a scene, two scenes before that that's not working that that made that scene not work. So there's also this reassessing constantly as you said because you're not you don't have this ideal situation of a linear process so from know? the from the editors that you knew including in your own family um do, do editors tend to come to every production with a similar philosophy about how to cut a movie or do they like to come to each one as its own unique thing i think the the bigger part of it is that every editor has a different strategy. I would say that's more common than that they would change their strategy according to the, the material. G give us an example or two of what you mean by what a strategy might be. Like some editors will find a moment in a scene and that they love and they'll build around that moment. Some editors um, block out sections and cut the approach it that way first. I One of the most fascinating, um, unusual things I, I heard was Tim Squires, who's an absolutely brilliant editor, is a very methodical person. And he would, when he would prepare to cut a scene, he would actually cut a version which with all close-ups, a version maybe with two shots, a version with masters. He would not use them. He just, it was a process he went through to orient himself and then he would start cutting the sequence. That's fascinating. Yeah, and then he, he edited Gosford Park for Robert Altman, <laughs> who is, he said, I thought I was gonna lose my mind. I bet. Because, because for someone who's very, you know, organ, so organized and methodical and he just, you know, he just let the camera sort of roam around and, and all the rules were broken and, you know, he would just, there was there were there was so much mismatching and just um, the coverage was so untraditional that he just had but he still did versions he still did a form of that because it was his system of working mm -hmm. and you know some editors uh, take tons of notes on the script and keep lo looking back to the script some editors don't pay that much attention to the script. Some editors take notes at dailies. Some no editors don't don't take notes on daily at dailies. So they're really, you know, it's it's a temperament thing, you know, too. It's, it's, it's an it's an art form, and they're coming at it as artists. Yeah, yeah, and like like I I just did an event um, honoring Dee Dee Allen and my late husband Sam Osteen. He he and Dee Dee were actually of the same era. They had completely opposite ways of working in a way because Dee Dee would, would try everything. She even made dupes of different versions, which in the days of film was a very um, unusual thing to do because it's, it's just a lot of work. It's not mm -hmm. like you could do versions on an Avid. And Sam would watch day, I mean, I assisted him. So in the days of film, you had the luxury to see what, what was the, the mental process of an editor physically because you're actually standing beside them or behind them and you're handing them trims or you're anticipating what they might ask for and then they don't ask for it or so you see kind of their mind working by um facilitating them with handing them film so sam would run dailies and then you know there'd be these little rolls of film on his editing bench 
from all the different takes and all the different coverage and he'd slide like maybe two thirds of them across his bench and not even ever look at them again. Like wow. he had already made up his mind before he started cutting what he wasn't going to use. And most of it he wasn't going to use. Well, he, uh, you know, uh, he certainly cut some of the very greatest movies that ever have come out of any kind of production from Chinatown, which is one of my all time top favorites uh, to the graduate, obviously to Rosemary's baby. I mean, he just, he worked on some huge, a uh, very influential uh, seminal movies. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think people talk about that it, many different cuts of his, but the one that I always go to in my thinking from a screenwriter's perspective, the cut in the graduate from uh, Dustin Hoffman diving into the pool to winding up on top of Mrs. Robinson. That's an exceptional cut. And that was, you know, that's this is the other thing, of course, about all art forms, but a lot of times you get lucky too, you know? And I'm not saying it was all luck, but there was a certain amount. They were very worried about this particular cut because what they really wanted to do, what you ideally do, it makes a much smoother, what they call an action cut, is when you have a dramatic change in angles. If the angles are too similar, it can be confusing to an audience. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to be at a completely different angle under, under him. And then when he jumps on top of her, it would be a completely different angle, but they couldn't get under the water. So it's sort of same angle, same angle, which is, which well, could have which could have not worked. It's so, brilliant. <laughs> yeah. And so what happened is. They were waiting for the dailies to come in. They, Sam and everybody, Mike Nichols too, was nervous about, is this going to work? And then he put it together and he, and he said, he's like yelled. He was so excited. And he, he, he said, Mike, you have to come and see this. You have to come and see this. Buck Henry, you know, they all ran to the cutting room and they were just beside themselves that it worked that well. But it, but it was the, the limitation of the shooting that made him make that fantastic cut. He did it well, but he had this weird problem that turned into an advantage. So you, so I, I am uh, very fond of stories of any kind of art form where there is a limitation to what they you can do in the production of the art, and that limitation frequently makes the art better because you don't have all the choices. I agree. You, yeah. I, and that's sometimes it's when you have less money, sometimes that's where great things come. Sometimes when you have less time, that's when great things come. Those limitations can actually be very beneficial to a, to a production. Um, do, you, do you think that editors tend to want to have some kind of a cut in mind before they go into production or that most editors want to know what happens as the footage comes? Absolutely the second. The, there's a you know, expression, the film tells me where to cut. It's mm. very instinctual. I mean, this is why it's so interesting to interview different editors because just because you're extremely talented doesn't mean you're necessarily verbal or articulate about your process. It, right. There's a huge variation in, in the editors I've interviewed. And it's partly because it's so instinctual and it's sometimes it's just hard to talk about because it just felt right, you know? And, and it's a rhythmic thing. It's a it's a visceral thing, you know? And that was my challenge. And when I wrote Cut to the Chase, which was basically uh, interviews with Sam mm -hmm. um, and in, in, with the framework of, of the um, periods in film history that, and the backgrounds of all these films we talked about, but people would say, how did you get him to talk <laughs> so much? <laughs> because he was not a verbal person. He wasn't, he wasn't, he just didn't talk a lot and he didn't talk a lot about his process. And it wasn't, you know, he was very much of the school, like Dee Dee Allen said, use the phrase cut with your gut, you know, mm -hmm. it just felt right. So they, I thought if I can get Sam to talk for an entire book, I think I can do this. Well, I like, I like what you said earlier that they're the first real, I mean, the, the, the director is really technically the first audience to look at the performances, but the editor is really shaping that performance, as you say, and they really are the first uh, audience that doesn't have a connection to the what happened in production. And so it has to be visceral, it has to be a gut reaction to something because that's what ultimately we don't sell intellectuality, we sell passion, we sell exactly. 
and sell right. visceral stuff. Um, I, I, how important is it? Uh, I already know the answer to this, but I want to hear your your take on it. How important is it for an editor to be a very uh, well versed um, well versed in the art of storytelling? Absolutely, the most essential thing. The most essential thing. That's yes. what they are. They're storytellers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, storytelling is everything. And and if they didn't understand how to tell a story, you would not. The audience would not be able to grasp probably most of everything that they Sam came used to say that when he uh, interviewed an assistant for a job, he'd ask him to tell a joke. Oh, because I, he didn't really do this all the time, but. But it's a it's a great concept because you tell just enough to create the impact you need for the payoff of the joke, and that's storytelling. Well, so it's interesting when I you know I've been teaching for a while, and I've also been a writer for a long, long time, and there is a rhyme and a reason to the way a story is told, and you can tell stories in many different ways, but the rhyme and reason to them are almost always the same. There is a beginning, a middle, and an end, and audiences perceive it that way. And if you tell a joke out of order, no one will understand what you're talking about. Or if you tell too much and you ruin the momentum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that going that's going all the way back to Aristotle in the Poetics about, you know, it's about beginning, middle, and end. Where do you start? You said that earlier about editors. Well, where do we begin this? And where do you begin a story? Where does a story go and how does it end? And it sounds simple to say, but it's extremely challenging to get right. Uh, and so that's what you're talking about. I want to talk for a moment about pace and rhythm. How important is it for an editor to have a good innate understanding of rhythms? Just like what, when I was talking about spatial perception, rhythm is essential and it's an innate ability. Mm -hmm. And by the way, a lot of editors, most editors are musicians. Mm. Um, I don't mean professional, but have a lot. Um, they understand that, time. Timing is, it's, I mean, that's what was so interesting too about the Moviola days is you were standing up, you were standing and using your body to kind of, act out when when you're going to make the cut and editors who move to sitting down or some of course walter merch is an example some editors continue to stand up when they when they had the avid or digital editing but um it's yes it's very much um an instinctual thing of when you know you never want to stay on something too long knowing when to when to get out is really important and an editor instinctually knows that, you know, and what is too much information? What is, you know, it's all, it's all rhythm, you know, it still and, comes down to that. And, and it can be one frame. It, it can be. And also the rhythm of performance. It's, it's very much rhythmic. It's very musical. It's very, you know, editors are, have to, it's a huge part of an editor's job is shaping performances. Well, and the rhythm totally. of speech and and also being brave enough when something's working not to cut into it to let the if the natural rhythms are working in a performance not to mess with them so most if not all soundtracks come after uh, after we get picture lock or it's way deep into a movie being cut which means that the editor is dictating that sort of rhythm as well and then along comes a composer and puts a musical rhythm on top of that. How important is it for the editor and the composer to talk, or is it not important at all? Well, I think I think the editor, it's important for the editor to be part of the spotting sessions when the composer and director are working together. But in terms of sound, also editors always put sound in their in their cuts. When you say sound, um, music and not just dialogue. Well, very often music as well, more more than ever. And sometimes it's n not a great idea because it can soften the problems when you're lulled into the beautiful music. But music can also be very helpful because it can be uh, a guide for the director and the composer. Um, and it can help the editor just create an effective scene. But, but the editors always put sound effects in. Um, and of course, it's more significant in action scenes, you know, to punctuate something with a 
door slam or a gunshot or whatever, but, but there's always some degree. And that is also a guide for, you know, that the editor can work with the sound designer, or the sound editor. I mean, they're all, it's a very collaborative art. They're always, a part of all that, the editor and the mixing too. Well, so I, you know, one of the questions that I love to ask folks in this business is about collaboration. What makes a good collaboration work? You, you're not going to love everybody that you work with throughout a whole career. Probably not. What, how does a, what makes a good collaboration work? How does that happen? Well, first you have to leave your ego at the door. <laughs> very important and editors fortunately are not alpha personalities normally so it's you know that that they're okay with that but it's the you know as i said before and i talk about this repeatedly the 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 analogy of marriage for an editor and director is very much applies um for example in a marriage, you know, pick your battles, you know, the editor could feel really strongly about something and really want that change, but they can't hammer the director with everything. They got to pick the ones, the battles they care the most about, and then there's strategies. So you, you show it to the director and they're very upset and they don't want to do it. So you wait a little while, maybe you'll show it again, you know, and just <laughs> having a diplomatic way and, and being, empathetic that they're they're the ones that are most on the line the director and just to be empathetic with what they're going through is part of the collaborative art but you know of course the ideal thing is when you've been with a, a, this marriage of uh, this quote marriage for a long time and you trust each other the editor and director and they kind of know anticipate what the other one is going to want and how they're going to respond and then you know the the trust and the and the sort of nonverbal language that starts to happen you know that you just sort of know each other and and it makes it m the best collaboration of course well well, well famously uh um certain directors have their own little family their own little production family obviously steven spielberg has had michael Kahn on who knows how many movies and as well as uh, john williams so that's a kind of almost like a little unbreakable unit up to a point right that's uh, wonderful yes it is wonderful and 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 clearly sam um worked with roman polanski on was it more than two movies or was it just the two and tess and tess so there's three. So Polanski knew that he could rely on uh, Sam's abilities to do to tell the story that he wanted to tell. I'm sorry, there's four movies. There's oh, what's Frantic, Tess. Oh, Frantic as well. But Tess, but Tess, he didn't, it was sort of, um, he came on later and then he wanted to make, he didn't really finish the movie, but he wanted to he wanted to do certain things to the movie and Roman wasn't willing to <laughs> shorten it in a certain way and he wasn't around. So he didn't actually finish it. He just helped for a while. How, um, how, I, how important is it for an editor to be a ruthless cutter, to not have any hesitation to cut something that isn't working when yet it may seem precious to, to the director? Well, that's the part of collaboration that we were just talking about, mm -hmm. I think. That's where you have to be sensitive. But if you feel really strongly as an editor, you you have to keep at it and really try to convince the director that it should be cut. I mean, that's the hardest thing. It's like there are directors that think they've shot things they haven't even shot because they so wanted it, you know, to be on screen, you know. Um, but that the whole thing about killing your babies, you know, mm -hmm. that's a very that's part of the editor's job, but it's a delicate job. You know? So you, you keep talking about things that are so similar to, to being a writer. They're, it's, it's very similar. Writers yeah. go through very similar process in a totally different way. But the, but the thought process is, you know, uh, it was Faulkner who said, you've, you've got to be willing to kill your, your darlings, which is babies, same things. Um, and it's this, you're talking about things over and over again that are very close to being what writers go through. Um, what do you think writers, uh, or sorry, not writers, but editors find fulfilling about the process? Is it the, is it the end result? Or is it the actual process of doing it? What, what do you think most editors like about the process? I think it's the challenge. It's like the puzzle of it. Um, you know, the, it's an incredibly challenging job and you, and, and you have 
infinite possibilities and the idea of you know making something sing you know mm -hmm. for an audience and and the reward of watching it in a theater at the end but also the process of getting there and you know and and you know making making things work that that nobody thought would work and surprises editors love to give directors surprises you know that they just found this thing and it's like oh my god how did you find oh this works so well i thought we were dead you know and they like saving a scene you know things like that and of course being appreciated like like i said sometimes it's really hard for editors because producers don't understand what they did or right. they get blamed for things they didn't do or it's it's in that way it can be very a very difficult job well that, that, i guess cinematographers have a similar thing though you can actually see how beautiful an image is you don't know how they got there a but it's different because a cinematographer you see how beautiful the images mm -hmm. is Mm -hmm. are so so imagine that you've saved a performance and this actor is really not very good and they and they get an academy award i mean <laughs> i actually know examples of this i'm not going to say who they are <laughs> this is something we can't talk about at events um you know that's the editor well well, you, well you could talk about it if you wanted to get into trouble <laughs> right <laughs> but but you know the editor is never going to be praised for that no one will ever know right whereas a cinematographer has a beautiful shot you see it or you see a beautiful costume you see it you know right. the editor is is there's a lot of invisible you know craftsmanship and wizardry and sleight of hand and things that no one will ever appreciate so they have to accept that they're kind of always going to be in the shadows that way and be rewarded enough for by the work itself and they're you know what they love what they do they rarely retire editors mm -hmm. really rarely retire <laughs> you well, know? A, well a, at the same time it's got to be a lot of fun on top of it yeah and they're usually you know they are an interesting combination of people you know they're very usually very organized and meticulous and a little bit nerdy and yet they're romantics <laughs> you know and they're they're very visual, they're rhythmic. So they have a lot of, and they have to have a deep sense of psychology. You know, they have to really understand behavior and be very sensitive. And they're really lovely people. And, you know, they're just very, very, um, like I said, they're not usually alpha personalities and they're, and they're very um, sensitive people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh so how often do you think it happens? It's probably pretty frequent, I would guess, that an editor starts working on a picture and they think they're making one movie and by the end it has shifted into some other thing. It's not what you started out to make. Well, I think it's, I think the bigger thing is more that they don't know what they have. I mean, not, not to say it becomes something different, but it just is better than they thought. Um, you know, like... The, maybe there's no stars in the movie and maybe they're just worried because maybe it's a very chancy story and they just don't know how it's going to come across. I mean, that's, that's the big reward. I, they're making one plus one equal three. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would say that that's, that's what I was kind of thinking that many editors go into things and they think they're going to make, they know what the script says. They know what the footage is coming out but they, and they think they're making this one thing, but by the end of it, it's turned into some other beautiful thing that they didn't realize they were making. Yeah, yeah, because the, you know, what what's in the script and what's, what's, what's actually, what ends up being shot is well, an entirely <laughs> different animal. And like exactly. I said, you know, it could be accidents, it could be, the actor that you doubted the most is the the best one or you know it, it could it just could evolve in a completely different way and as you said limitations sometimes cause cause that the most to happen sure. whereas you have a big fancy production where everything's going to all the money and all the time it may be less likely to happen you know do you, do you know any production even the most expensive productions that that don't want more time <laughs> There's no such thing. They never I don't have know. Mike time. Nichols on The Graduate. I, well, he, yeah, I mean, 
in terms of shooting and rehearsal, I, I don't think he wanted more time. I think he took the time. He had a lot of power and he took an incredible, he had six months of pre-production. Wow. I mean, yeah. But he, <laughs> you know, other than you hear about Clint Eastwood going in and shooting under, under schedule and under budget on every movie, most people don't get there ever. Uh, yeah. With, with you know, some people, I mean, like Sidney Lumet, prided himself in that you know sure. he camera cut he sort of preconceived all those shots and he spent very he worked you know civilized hours during shooting and well and of course hitchcock famously had everything boarded down to the to the right. he, he used to say he could just hand it over to the cinematographer and walk away it doesn't need to be there which of course is not true but he would say that because he was so overly well prepared well he storyboarded everything everything you, yeah. you know sure absolutely, absolutely. yeah uh, um uh if you were starting out today and you wanted to be an editor what would you say it would take patience and perseverance and i'll tell you one thing that i see in every successful editor's story mm -hmm. is that um they all started out so passionately and they worked their asses off they they volunteered for extra things give me anything just those are the people that made it because mm -hmm. Luck and timing, unfortunately, have something to do with success, but you're increasing your odds by doing that because someone's going to notice you and it's 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 that extra passion and commitment and willing to work hard and editors work extremely hard anyway through their entire careers, but it's that that hit the ground running is this really do you really want to be an editor because if it's just a stepping stone to something else you're not going to make it if you really want it it's going to make a difference in how successful you become mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's for sure all right so i want to talk for a while about you as a writer because you've uh, you, you're not only an educator and a historian and so on but you're also a writer um tell us about the the your your writing uh cut to the chase and the invisible cut um uh, and also making the cut at Pixar. Um, what was your purpose in writing each of those books? Well, the purpose um, for writing Cut to the Chase was here I was married for 23 years to this brilliant person who I knew, I knew all the stories, I'd worked with him. And of course, the other thing we did, which, which actually I don't usually talk about is that when I was working with him and after I was working with him as an assistant, he did a lot of doctor jobs, which are jobs where a movie's in trouble and they would come to a master editor and can you help us? And a lot of times we, we together would write up, we would brainstorm what needs to be fixed and we would write, I would write them. I would write a presentation of what needs to be done. Sometimes Sam would come in and actually recut the movies, but sometimes we would just write things up and um, so I, that experience of being with Sam and, and seeing all the wisdom from him and, and his process, I thought, I, I need to record this. I need to, to have him share. And so what we would do is, as I said, he wasn't a talker, but we would run everything he worked on. Of course, I tried to get more information at the movies. I thought people would be really excited about, like The Graduate or Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. Or, sure. Um, and then I said to, even though I knew a lot of stories, I said, stop when you have something to say. And so that was, you know, so then he would tell me more stories than I knew because a lot of these films he worked on before he met me as well. And then, um, so Invisible Cut was sort of off of that. I just thought I was, I wanted to write a book where, um, you really got into the window, a window into the editor's head in a, in a more global sense, not just Sam. I did, I did also take classic sequences from a lot of movies and do frame grabs, which is not an ideal way. I didn't have the, the advantage of having actual footage to show, but right. I, in and out frames to show cuts and deconstruct the editing process that way. And just um, demystify the process with wisdom that I, I, you know, acquired from not only from Sam, but from other editors and just 
to try to explain art, the art and technique of edit, sort of a, an editing Bible in a way, the art and technique of editing. And then um, the beauty about making the cut at Pixar, which I wrote with Bill Kinder, who was head of post-production at Pixar for 17 years. And we were a great sort of yin-yang combination because we brought completely different things to the process. Um, but we have the luxury of having actual footage of um, never before seen from Pixar's vault. Oh, wow, of, wow. Or, you know, early storyboards and, and layout and things like that. And so it's, that's gonna be, there's a whole component of that book which will show actual footage and editors being interviewed and talking over different different processes they went through where you can actually see, for example, the opening sequence of Up, which of course, Married Life, everybody loves oh, that. that we, that's one that, of the most emotional 15 minutes in the whole history of movies. And it didn't work at first because it was, there were, we show early attempts and we explain why it didn't work and when, because, partly because it was too long. And it's amazing how, how, how that matters, you know, like when we were talking about telling a joke. So um, I'm very excited about that because I didn't have the luxury to have footage, a show and tell, and now we have the ultimate show and tell. And of course we had at full access, you know, it's authorized. We had full access to all these Pixar editors wow. you know, and creative heads like story leads and layout guys and directors and producers. So, so it's like full circle, you know, that I, and, and also animation editors are, this is where Pixar was really smart starting with Toy Story and Lee Anchorage because it just so happened that Lee had this incredible, um, fearlessness with technology, but he was also a filmmaker and they had no, you know, they were all animators. They didn't know anything about cinema. So he, it was this great sort of convergence of, and the editor became the center, the, the hub of the production process. They're involved in all the story. I mean, the editors don't get to sit in on story pitching and writing of the screenplay and if only they included editors in live action movies it would be great but they don't and and editors can ask for anything they can ask for coverage at any time they're part of the you know the shooting process so it's it's like the idealized situation for an editor and people have no idea how much animation editors do it's a, it's quite astounding well the the you know, i i spent uh, 20 years writing animation uh, you know uh, and and so it's a very um very unique set of circumstances that bring you into that world because are there better storytellers in the world than pixar the answer is simple it's no they're the best storytellers in the world because and they spend so much time, time. on it too. but they but they so but they have this time animators well if you're pixar not every animator but if you're pixar you have this massive advantage of of uh being able to say this works and this doesn't work let's throw it out and start over again or go in a totally different direction exactly. and it can take them years to develop something and it's so inexpensive because it's just drawing so it doesn't matter so they you know when it's inexpensive that's when they spend the time when sure. they just yeah, and they spend two or three years just on story. Which just is on story. And just and story. you hear the stories about the, the voiceover actors. They'll record a whole bunch of stuff. And then six months later, they have to record a whole new bunch of stuff. And six months later, it's a whole new bunch of stuff. And that just goes on and on. And so the editorial process, I think that's interesting that I didn't know that the editors are involved in the story creation process as well. From Not the so beginning. much maybe the story idea the concept, mm -hmm. but you know, this, the, when they're pitching the story, you know, with the book, they used to put them on pin, now it's all digital, but when a, when a story artist is pitching ideas and they then they cut it together, they cut the boards together and they say, oh, this doesn't work. Whoa. And so they're in the meetings and they're also editing before they shoot. You know, you edit first, shoot later in animation. It's, so, it's, it's animation and going back to Disney, um, where you had this creation of a thing called a storyboard, where people pinned up their concepts yeah. and drawings. That, that's where storyboarding came from. 
was from actually putting it on a board. But the editors in those days, before computer animation, before Toy Story, were not in the room, and now they're in the room, you know, and they're and they're part of the process because they work very intensely with story artists, you know. So, so, so you got to interview all these folks, yes? Yeah. And that was your research was to go in and, and dive That's into their started. world. That's how we started. Yeah. By chatting with folks. Yeah. And then and, that would engender, you know, which scenes we decided to talk about. And then we would, you know, we would pull things out of the vault. Wow. And, uh, wow. Yeah. Did, did you, uh, okay. So as a writer, you also would have to be an editor of your own work. Do you, yes. did you find that process similar to cutting footage? When you're when you're cutting what you've written, um, well, here's here's one thing I learned. I I pray that I finally learned my lesson because I've now written three books and I still didn't learn my lesson even on this last one. <laughs> do not, and this could be true in editing too, film editing. Do not spend forever on the first chapter. Don't do it because you want to get it perfect. I mean, Bill and I spent so much time on the first. I'd say three chapters that which were all kind of short. So it was a short part. And then of course it it changes, you know, and 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 <laughs> and you look back and say, why did we take so long? Every line doesn't have every and the first sentence or the first paragraph, who cares? You, and and this goes back to something I wanted to also emphasize is objectivity. You know, you work something to death, especially when you're starting out, and you completely lose your objectivity you can't even see it anymore you have to walk away but you know I did it every book and we did it and Bill and I talked about it like oh my god we spent so much time on that and then we changed all of it because the later part of it you know evolved in a way that it we had to rework it and so not only do you lose objectivity but you also you're wasting time because it's not going to be that later on. So and I'm then, a, I'm a great believer in what are known as purge drafts and you just purge it all out and it all comes out. And then, then you begin to shape it. So the, the, the craft part of it and the story part of it to a certain extent is throwing it all down onto paper or making your first cut of the of footage, which is not the final cut and then shaping that. So, okay, I'm going to tell you, yes, so to, to make it, to bring it to editing, so this was my original source of inspiration. So Sam did something which was extremely unusual as an editor, but it was so smart in terms of objectivity. He would, and this is in the days of film, the expression tails out, meaning that <laughs> he would cut a reel and have a tails out. So what, what, was, is, what does tails out mean? I mean, he didn't rewind and look at it. He put it together and left it tails out. He didn't rewind be, it. Because, because in those days, you were actually cutting onto a reel of actual solid film. It wasn't digital at all. Right. So by not, he, and, and I would say, but aren't you worried? What if you, I mean, aren't you, and don't you want to make sure you got it perfect and the director's going to see it? And don't you want to keep working? He said, no, because I have to keep my objectivity. <laughs> so unless there were, I mean, it takes a lot of confidence, of course, to do that too, but to a degree, it's still an inspiring story, I think, because his object, his, so he said when he watched it with the director, he, he was watching it as audience because he would, he had a distance. He, he worked hard on it, but then he didn't want to look at it because he needed to step away. And, you know, and, and he always had this expression, let the sores heal. If you pick at it to death, they will never heal. Oh, wow. That's, that's really good. So if you're struggling with a, 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 a chapter or a scene as an editor, try as try to just go home and try not to look at it for a couple days even just as long as you can stay away because you'll be amazed at how objective you are and i have so experienced that as a writer just i can't see it anymore and i just don't be obsessive just walk away <laughs> it's very common for students in classes to do exactly what you're talking about where they can't get off of the first scene or off of the first 
sentence or whatever they can't get away from. And what we try to emphasize and what you're talking about is just lay it all out. It's not going to be perfect no matter what you do. So why worry about perfection in the first go at it and then come back and reshape? And so it works in film editing and it works in writing and editing for writers. Um, and that's the way it should be, is that you get it all out and then you come back and rework it. That's where the, that's where the, the art comes in. The art is in that shaping. What, what great editors and what great writers do is they come in shape and make it an art after the fact. But you need to have that first thing. You got to have that lump of unshaped clay and you have to make the clay. And that's what the first draft is. And it's amazing. I still haven't learned the lesson. I hopefully, I have. <laughs> but no, you just yeah, you're totally right. It's so so important, and it's it's a very um, when you're eager and you're maybe nervous and insecure, like you said, your students who are just wanting. Mm -hmm. It's so hard to let go, but you you. It is. And you have to be willing at going back. We've already talked about it. You have to be willing to kill your darlings because sometimes you write a line and you think that's the best line I'm ever going to write. And it doesn't fit anymore after you're done and you have a whole piece. Um, what would you say the biggest challenges you faced in writing the books or one or one or more of them? What would you say are the big challenges for you? I mean, I think, I think it's, it's the challenge of knowing where you're going and trusting the process and it's it's still part of the objectivity lesson mm -hmm. i think but uh just whatever the creative process is that involves self-doubt you know and just um just so it wasn't 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 physical things for you it wasn't getting um to meet these people that you needed to interview it wasn't the costs of doing it it wasn't it was none of that it was trying to figure out the uh, your own objectivity on it I mean, you know, I, I guess, well, Sam's was different because it was really more putting things on paper material. But I, I think both with Invisible Cut and, and making, making the Cut of Pixar, I think both of those, the biggest challenge is that editing is hard to explain. You know, it's just very, very hard. And whether it's computer animation or whether it's live action, I just wanted to make sure, and we wanted to make sure with in case of picture me and Bill that, you know, we can communicate concepts to an audience that doesn't have to be filmmakers, that not dumbing it down and not nerding it up. You know what I mean? Just <laughs> finding that sort of middle ground where it's compelling and interesting, but also to make concepts graspable, you know, and, and, and make not only make people appreciate what editors do, but just make them understand something that's really not the written word is not conducive to describing editing. It's a visual, instinctual, rhythmic, um, visceral art form. You know, so how do you talk about it? It's well, very hard. Well, that's why you can't become a filmmaker by reading books. Exactly. You you have to actually be a filmmaker or you can't become a painter by reading books. And by the way, you can't become a writer just by reading books, though you need to read some books. Um, uh, it's the same thing. You have to do it, as they say, as Nike used to say, just do it, you know? Yeah. And I mean, it's funny, though, editors sometimes, I think a lot of editors I've, I've interviewed, they go into it saying, I, I don't have anything to say, you know, they I remember Jerry Greenberg, who was one of the greats. I mean, he's an amazing editor. Um, French Connection was one of his films, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. so many, Kramer versus Kramer. And he also cut the, the death scene in Bonnie and Clyde, by the way. Oh, wow. wow. Um, yes. Uh, he, I remember meeting him before this event at a restaurant and I'd never met him before. And he said, Bobby, you seem like a lovely person, but you know, this thing we're doing tomorrow, that's really not my, I don't have anything to say about editing, you know, it just, there's nothing to talk about. It just, it, I do it. And, and so Carol Littleton then showed up um, a little later and we're sitting there having dinner and a little bit of wine and I'm sitting there. I wish I had recorded this. They, they were talking for maybe three hours about <laughs> editing. <laughs> and so it's that thing of, you know, how do you elicit 
the essence of editing for they're they're resistant because they're right it is hard to talk about but it but you can talk about it. as you say it's not gonna it's you're not gonna learn how to edit but you're going to get enough insights and strategies and wisdom and technique just from talking about their work not talking about it in abstract form it's the abstraction part is very difficult but th the more you get them to actually talk about what they actually did by example talking by that's when you get you you elicit responses you know well i i, I in a similar vein uh, not to uh, pat myself on the back at all, um, but this show that I do here called Story Beat, I have had many, many, many guests come on this show and tell me ahead of time, I have not, I'm, there's no way we'll get an hour out of this. And of <laughs> course, at the end of the hour, they say, wow, that went by really fast because they were talking their heads off about what they do. And that's what you're talking about is once you get a couple of people in a room that know what each other do, <laughs> they understand the process so they start to talk about they talk shop as what it winds up being. you know what you know it's also really rewarding because editors so rarely get get attention you know they're kind of, of behind the scenes invariably just before we go up on stage in the old days before zoom <laughs> before covid they, they were mostly dreading it or thinking they were going to just be terrible and they would always come off the stage and be on such a high because you know, because they are passionate and once you, they get going, That's they're going to, yeah, you know, you, you like I you do said. Know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's exactly what it is. Uh, um, uh, what, I just want to talk for two seconds about publishers. Was there anything that you can lend as advice to people who are trying to get a book published about what you should do as a writer that is helpful toward gaining a publisher? I think very important to to decide what the best publisher is for your particular book right you know it's, it's um and don't give up um you know because you might you might get a few rejections along the way you have to yes but uh you know i think i think uh it's it's the matching i think sometimes people go after publishers that are not appropriate for their book and mm -hmm. it may not be the biggest publisher and don't be deceived by that that doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily mean that you know it's it's like a lot of things in that kind of approach is that sometimes you're a bigger fish in a smaller pond that's okay you know they may give you more put more into it because they're appreciative of you if they're a small publishing house so i i would say don't don't presume anything um and believe in yourself and don't and be a nag and be a nag oh well you gotta be careful about being nagging too no much. i i nag is a negative word but i'm just saying i i just think this is true in general just sometimes people don't respond because of reasons that you don't think are the reasons well you that's know? true throughout the whole of the entertainment industry you don't exactly. know why people reject you yeah you don't know and and you may not even be rejected they just may have maybe it takes that third email or you know i mean you have to you have to be strategic and you don't you don't want to be annoying but there is there is the squeaky wheel you know <laughs> That yes, that, that is yes, that is true. Yeah. Well, I've, I've been I've been speaking today with uh, this fantastic human being, Bobby Osteen, uh, on what she does uh, to help editors and cinephiles understand the art of editing, um, as well as uh, as being a writer herself. And we've been in this for a little more than an hour now. And I'm just going to wind this down with one last question for you. We've already heard a ton of advice. And I'm wondering, do you have maybe one more piece of solid piece of advice or a tip that you can lend to uh, those who are starting out in the business? We've, we've already heard you speak a couple of times about that. Or maybe people are in and trying to get to that next level, what they can do to plus themselves, to get up, up the chain, as they say. It may sound corny, but the most important thing is to be a nice person <laughs> and, and, and to be that person that someone wants to work with. In the film industry, I, I can say it's a very small town and I don't, and you know, kindness and, and someone who is willing to 
collaborate and be flexible and is enthusiastic goes a long way. Like for example, editors have told me when they interview assistants for a job, they, now this is a natural tendency. You may want to sell yourself and just talk about yourself a lot, but that be careful because you should also talk about how excited you are about that particular project and why, because that enthusiasm and also your insights, maybe about the screenplay or the project, they want, they're gonna ask you your opinions when you work with them. They want to know you have interesting things to say, but it's also just, it's, you know, especially in editing, it's a very small room. There's a small rooms, it's, there's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of egos, there's a lot of deadlines and, if you can be that person that that is positive and kind and someone wants to work with it's and there's two people that are equally qualified, but one is a nicer person or more pleasant person more enthusiastic person that person is going to get the job. Mm -hmm. I think that that's really, really wise advice. Uh, it, you, you there is no substitute for just being a good person. Nope. And it's, it's also better to be a good person anyway <laughs> in life. In all things. It, in all things. And, and it, what goes around comes around. It's really, I've, I mean, I, I see it in the successful editors. It's the work ethic and the, the, the niceness is very important. Well, that's exceptional advice. I mean, exceptional. And, and, and it, that will carry you in any industry, not just in the motion picture or entertainment industry, that will carry you through life, as you say, in a very uh, successful way. Bobby Osteen, this has been a, just a fantastic hour on Story Beat, and I'm so appreciative and so glad that you uh, stopped by and, and had this chat with me today. And I, I just want to thank you for just giving the world all this great advice. Well, thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. And so we've come to the end of today's Story Beat. If you like this episode, won't you please take a moment to give us a comment, rating, or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great StoryBeat episodes to you. StoryBeat is available on all major podcast apps and platforms, including Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, TuneIn, and many others. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden. And may all your stories be unforgettable.